Hello! A silly video today. Ish over on the Deprogram Discord server shared this iceberg with me, which I thought we could have a little fun with. Speaking of which, go have a listen to the podcast. I run it with the Gopnik and Second Thought, and we have a great time talking about socialism, history, and general nonsense we encounter in our daily lives. I also talk about all the weird patients I see, so go have a listen. Anyways, if you're unaware, an iceberg is supposed to be an image with certain concepts, slash places, slash events, or ideas arranged in increasingly weird or obscure fashion. Now, the first four layers of this are relatively straightforward, things that a lot of people already know about, so I'll skip those for now. If you really want me to cover them, then just let me know, but currently I think there's no point. I'll start from the bottom up first. Nineteen twenty one to nineteen twenty four monarcho Bolshevik theocratic Khanate. That's a mouthful. As a result of the waning influence of the Qing or Qing dynasty in China, I've heard both ways said, certain Mongol nobles got together and decided on Mongol independence. This state of affairs lasted from nineteen eleven to nineteen twenty four when Mongolia itself was declared independent and outer Mongolia was brought back into the fold of China. During these interim years, though, those same nobles installed a theocratic king, the 8th Bokht Gigen, that being the highest authority of Tibetan Buddhism in Mongolia, who himself took the title of Bogd Khan, meaning Holy Ruler. This Buddhist theocratic state was only recognized by the then also unrecognized Tibet, and led the development of its military and economy through Buddhist officials that had no experience with this sort of stuff before. Unsurprisingly, this didn't work out too well, and they were militarily and diplomatically outmaneuvered into non-existence. Hey, at least they had cool hats. They also used bricks of tea as currency, which is kind of cool. A funny tidbit, apparently Tsar Nicholas refused to talk to these people on account of, and I quote, their Mongol imperialism. Very rich. The Bolshevik aspect of this I'm missing though, as in 1921 there was a pro-Soviet Mongolian revolutionary movement that defeated white Russian forces in Mongolia and then basically took power, as the Bokht Khan had no real power himself at that point. There's even a beautiful painting of the rather ceremonious transfer of power from the Bokht Khan to the revolutionaries, which you're seeing right now. North Korean Internet Dating Websites As with most things North Korea related, finding reputable sources that aren't just spewing nonsense is next to impossible. All I could find was unsourced tabloid garbage. Apparently, like in most imperial periphery societies, a common way of finding a significant other is through matchmaking services. Equally unsurprising is that there are matchmakers who make online databases with this info. You contact a matchmaker, together you look through the lists and try to find somebody suitable for you. You go on a few dates and see if something develops. Not an outlandish concept, really. They try to paint it as very strange and secretive, and also repeatedly mention how you have to pay for these services. Of course, unlike dating services or apps in the West, apparently. Uh, there's not really much more to this one. Dylan Klebold Soviet Pin Dylan Klebold, I have no idea if I'm saying his name right, was one of the two people who carried out, well, the only famous thing with the name Columbine is associated with nowadays. He went for an edgy look and this pin was part of the aesthetic. According to a friend of his who asked about the pin, he replied that it was just to get a reaction out of people. Again, not really too much to this one. Marx predicting artificial intelligence. This is referring to a particular segment from one of Marx's notebooks that would eventually make up his unfinished Gundisa. In it, Marx says, once adopted into the production process of capital, the means of labor passes through different metamorphoses, whose culmination is the automatic system of machinery set in motion by an automaton, a moving power that moves itself. This automaton consisting of numerous mechanical and intellectual organs, so that the workers themselves are cast merely as its conscious linkages. He further on goes on to say, rather, it is the machine which possesses skill and strength in place of the worker, it itself the virtuoso, with a soul of its own in the mechanical laws acting through it, and it consumes coal or oil just as the worker consumes food to keep up its perpetual motion. Finally, labor no longer appears so much to be included within the production process, rather the human being comes to relate more as a watchman and regulator to the production process itself. As soon as labor in the direct form has ceased to be the great wellspring of wealth, labor time ceases and must cease to be its measure. Capitalism thus works towards its own dissolution as the form dominating production. It's definitely interesting, but reading modern AI into it is somewhat anachronistic, I feel. The 1898 International Anti-Anarchist Conference This is a reference to the International Conference of Rome for the Social Defense Against Anarchists. Basically, in the end of the 1800s, quite a few royals were assassinated by anarchists. In this case, the event that triggered this conference was the assassination of Elizabeth of Austria by Luigi Luceni, a guy whose looks rival those of young Stalin, if I'm being honest. 
In this conference, delegates from 21 countries get together to essentially place limitations on anarchist activity and to increase police cooperation between nations. This was a reaction to the then popular anarchist concept of propaganda of the deed, in which a certain act, usually violent such as bombings or assassinations, would supposedly stir the working class into insurrectionary revolt. Of course this never happened and in fact only did the inverse. This was also a major disagreement between Marxists and anarchists. But yeah, that's about it. Soviet Berwick upon Tweed peace meeting. This is referring to a fictional event that somehow made its way into the British press, but essentially when the Crimean War of 1854 was started, England declared war on Russia with Queen Victoria signing the declaration in her full title. That being Victoria, Queen of Great Britain, Ireland, Berwick upon Tweed and the British dominions beyond the sea. When peace was declared after the war, the British representatives forgot the Berwick upon Tweed part, supposedly, and as a result the small town with a population of 12,000 people was still at war with Tsarist Russia and afterwards the Soviet Union. There doesn't seem to be a reliable source to verify that this actually was a thing. Hitler and Soviet Bavaria This is a reference to the Bavarian Soviet Republic, a short-lived result of the German Revolution that lasted about a month in 1919. During this brief period, differing army battalions and units elected representatives to soldiers' councils, and Hitler was elected deputy battalion representative. He appears to have been an informant that basically snitched on his fellow soldiers, in Mein Kampf, he even recalls the incident in which he was about to be arrested by the revolutionary government, but had escaped. Soviet Bavaria was brought down by the Freikorps, which later on made up noticeable contingents of the Nazi ruling and military apparatus. The video. The Gnostic Left. Spooky. This is in reference to some analysis of certain American conservatives of the Democratic Party, which they claim is left-wing, which is patently false, which has apparently adopted a Gnostic approach to political reality. Gnosticism was a philosophical approach to religion that emphasized personal spiritual knowledge above orthodox teachings, traditions, and the authority of religious institutions. The parallel these conservatives are trying to draw is basically another facts don't care about your feelings, and it doesn't get any deeper than that really. Most of these conservatives too are Christians, and Gnosticism was viewed as a heresy back in the day, so the parallel has this second dimension also. TLDR, this isn't a real thing. The Red Prince of Laos. This is in reference to Prince Sofan Ovong, who was a royal of Laos and a communist. He supported Ho Chi Minh and convened the first congress of the Lao Freedom Front, and later on joined the Lao People's Revolutionary Party. When they seized power in 1975, he was elected as president of Laos and served until 1991. He was also one of the main leaders of the revolutionary forces during the Laotian Civil War. Interestingly, the US dropped nearly 3 million tons of ordnance on Laos during this period, causing the death of tens of thousands, and unexploded American ordnance still manages to kill nearly 50 people every year. Got all of that freedom and democracy they were dropping. Hana Qaddafi This is in reference to Qaddafi's adopted child, who was reported to have been killed at only 6 months old by an American airstrike in 1986. There's a lot of conflicting information regarding this, with some claiming she never existed, some claiming she was never killed, and that she became a doctor that currently works in Libya, and others claiming that she did die and Gaddafi adopted another daughter and gave her the same name. None of the sources around her are conclusive, but regardless, it's definitely not beneath the United States government to target infants, they did and continue to do so all the time from Yemen to Afghanistan. PMLI supporting ISIS. Oh boy, this one's a doozy. The Italian Marxist Leninist Party is a party that formed after several splits with other Italian communist parties and is fairly obscure today. Their general secretary is like 90 years old too, which just baffles me. Their ideology is, according to them, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, and they have strange takes like calling Hoxha, the former leader of Socialist Albania, a Trotskyist. They also published an article in which they basically denounced Italian military efforts against ISIS on the grounds that it could precipitate attacks against Italians, while also commenting on how ISIS didn't just arise from nowhere but was a direct result of Western imperialist meddling in the region. It seems like their position at the time was slightly more nuanced than quote unquote supporting them, but also yeah, it definitely isn't the best take. All their other articles are in Italian so I couldn't find any update, if they made one at all. German Greens supporting the DPRK this is in reference to the support of the German Green Party in the 80s of North Korea as a result of their ecological policies, partially out of a political commitment to green energy and partially as a result of heavy sanctions placed on the DPRK, preventing it from utilizing more conventional and polluting forms of energy. Louise Rinzer, a leading figure of the German Greens and someone imprisoned by the Nazis for her anti-fascist resistance, visited the DPRK a dozen times and even wrote a book on her experiences titled A North Korean Diary. He developed a friendship with the leader of the DPRK, Kim Il-sung, who said to her, I think you're an old comrade of mine because we both fought against fascism. I know you lost your husband to the fascists and you were put in prison and even sentenced to death. That's why I respect you and regard you as my comrade. DPRK Yom Kippur War 
This is in reference to the support Egypt received from the DPRK during the Yom Kippur War, in which 20 air pilots and other non-military personnel went to Egypt to help with the war effort. To this day, the DPRK doesn't recognize Israel and refers to it as an imperialist satellite state. No lies detected. Orthodox Jewish Anarchism this is in reference to certain rabbis and other Jewish religious figures that believe there was some parallel between Jewish political practice and anarchism. Several of them wrote books on the topic, and there were some secular Jewish organizations that advocated for their anarchist views. The more religious of these used references such as the Book of Samuel and Book of Judges, in which the Jewish people, after appointing Saul as king, instead of having God as king over them, having to contend with conscription, taxation, and other stuff that they later on didn't like so much. Bob Black Letter to Seattle Police This is in reference to Bob Black, an anarchist author who, like most contemporary anarchist authors, no one takes seriously, even amongst anarchists themselves. His literature and positions are an incoherent mess of post-left anti-work, quote-unquote anti-authoritarian, and weirdly anti-democratic nonsense. Keeping within his anti-authoritarian image, he willfully became a police informant and began snitching on people in the circles he frequented, one of which was through a letter in which he talks of how another author he knew made opium at home and consumed it in tea. You can pause and read the letter if you'd like. Mao's to Neocon Pipeline in France Much like the Trotskyist II Neocon Pipeline in Britain, many former Mao's of the 60s, 70s, and 80s in France went on to become neoconservatives. There's not really much more to this one. East Germany still exists in Cuba. This is in reference to the Ernst Thälmann Island off the southern coast of Cuba, which was ceremonially gifted quote -unquote, to East Germany in the 70s after an official state visit of Castro to the DDR, with it being named after a German revolutionary leader that was imprisoned, left in solitary confinement for 11 years and then shot in a concentration camp on Hitler's personal order. Some newspaper in Germany tried to argue that the island now belongs to modern Germany, but no one took that seriously. As for the DDR still existing quote -unquote, in Cuba, that's also not true, it was just a change of name. Stalin was pro-hamburgers. <laughs> this is in reference to an official visit Anastas Mikoyan, the Minister of Foreign Trade of the USSR, made to the US in the 30s. One of the things he observed was American burger culture, <laughs> <La Mau. laughs> which upon returning to the USSR had adapted into the Mikoyan cutlet, essentially a burger patty, sometimes with some filling, made of either ground beef, chicken, fish, or pork. It was served either grilled or fried, and was eaten more as a protein on a dish along with potatoes and a salad rather than on a burger. Where Stalin plays into this, I have no idea, but during a conservative political action conference meeting, Trump's former deputy assistant gave a speech saying, they, meaning the Democrats, want to take away your pickup truck, they want to rebuild your home, they want to take away your hamburgers. This is what Stalin dreamed about but never achieved. <laughs> yes. Juche Party in Nepal. This is in reference to the Nepal Workers and Peasants Party, a communist party, which was founded in 1975. It's of interest because it officially adopted Juche, the state ideology of DPRK, as its own. Basically, it's an emphasis on political independence and economic self-sufficiency. The party actually seems to be fairly popular in the city it's based out of, and there's not much more that's controversial about them that I found at least. Just an oddity as a result of Juche, it seems. Kamate emails. This is in reference to Jacques Kamate. I don't care if I mispronounce his name, French is a waste of time. A left communist turned anarcho-primitivist slash accelerationist. He basically went so far left that he abandoned Marx and began claiming that capital has superseded all relations and that revolution is no longer possible. Instead, he started advocating for a return to nature and deindustrialization. In regards to the emails, the only thing I could find is this, which apparently was a reply to a now lost email to Kamata asking him something. If you want, you can pause and read it. I too like figs, so uh, I guess that there's a parallel there. This is just obscure internet nonsense at this point. This man hasn't published anything since like the 70s. Mao's Mangoes This is in reference to a cultural revolution event that began in 1968, when 30,000 factory workers occupied a university in Beijing as a response to increased sectarianism and disorder caused by student red guards. Mao agreed with the action and sent baskets of mangoes gifted to him by a Pakistani diplomat to the workers as a thank you with a note attached that stated that the workers, rather than the red guards, are now in charge of the cultural revolution. After this, mango fever spread over the country, and the mangoes played a role in delegitimizing the red guards. Thousands of mango replicas traveled up and down the country in glass containers, carried in parades and placed on display as a symbol of the party's approval of worker action. Reading up on this online though, you're going to be flooded with so much racist shit it's insane. Ultraquists killed Rosa first. This along with another entry, titled just Desert, are the only things I couldn't find anything relevant on. Ultraquism was a 16th century Hussite belief on how communion should be administered in their reformist Christian churches. 
I couldn't find anything relevant from this to link to Luxembourg. So if somebody knows, then please leave it down in the comments. I'm interested. I thought I'd go through all of them today, but just this tier alone has gone on for long enough, so maybe I'll split it up for later. Let me know if this was interesting and if you want to see the rest of this silly iceberg. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting